I grew up in Moscow. I was born in a family not very well off, uh, up until my teens at least. And uh, I was homeschooled. That's probably the most interesting thing about me because it was very uncommon in Russia at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was homeschooled for financial reasons as well because my parents could not afford a good uh, private school and uh, government schools were just terrible and they decided to, to homeschool me and I homeschooled most of my life. I had a little break when I went to Canada for a year into mm -hmm. a boarding school, um, Appleby College, which is uh, quite famous in Canada. I didn't like it at all. I returned to Russia and finished homeschooling and I think it was the best decision of my life. How was a normal class day being homeschooled? Because it's not really common either here in Chile. How yeah. Who was your teacher? Uh, do you see, uh, looking back, uh, uh, any advantages and disadvantages of being homeschooled? I, I see a lot of missed opportunities, but not because uh, homeschool uh, is a bad choice. It's just because my parents were so inexperienced and mm. there was no opportunities to learn how it's done. So I can see that uh, I could have learned much more uh, than I did. But uh, even what I learned was more and better than what I would have learned at school. And uh, I was very worried when I uh, uh, enrolled into university that I would lag behind I mm -hmm. because like you know those people they finished schools and I never did uh, and uh, it turned out to be the opposite like the first the first year at university I just couldn't understand why <laughs> my uh, mates didn't know the things that I that were obvious to me <laughs> uh, but there wasn't much structure to what to the way I was learning uh, I was lucky enough to that my par parents had uh, a lot of background knowledge themselves. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather, he was uh, quite a famous uh, scientist in Russia, scientist mm -hmm. in Russia, a physician. Um, uh, uh, my, 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 my parents are doctors, medical doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were able to teach me biology. Uh, I had an English teacher coming, uh, coming um, to teach me, but other than that, and I had like my, my grandmother's friend she was uh, a very knowledgeable uh, in literature and history. She was, her father was friends with uh, Leo Tolstoy. And he oh. had like his books, his autographs, his portraits, all those things. So I get lucky. I, had, I come from a good family, not from a rich family, mm -hmm. but from a very good family. Uh, and they were able to give me a decent education themselves. But uh, again, because they had no experience, because they had nowhere to learn from, uh, I see a lot of missed opportunities. The thing that people mention when I talk about uh, homeschooling is that, oh, how do you, do you socialize? And you, you know, mm. children need to socialize. There's so many ways people can socialize today. Even back then, uh, I was, uh, I got uh, uh, interested in internet very early on. So in 1995, I was 10 years old and I was already online, you know, this wow. <laughs> antique version of internet. Yes. I was, yeah, it was very unusual at the time, uh, but, uh, uh, I socialized through socialized through net meeting. Mm -hmm. If anyone remembers what it is, it was something that was way before ICQ even, <laughs> and you probably don't remember what ICQ is. So uh, <laughs> it was one of this rudimentary uh, messaging system that was meant for business, but allowed you know, to look for friends <laughs> on the internet. Now very popular, by the way, because right? The yeah, 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 the yeah, very like Facebook and yes, all this. Yes, yes, it was media. it was not very popular, but uh, I socialized uh, on the internet. I socialized, and then when I turned into like my late teens that's when you started to get proper social networks like live journal for example and live journal was uh, opened the world for me uh, in Russia it was a very big deal I think it can be compared to MySpace maybe mm -hmm. the same like it was a similar MySpace was a similar phenomenon in the US uh, like live journal was in Russia and uh, I made great friends I uh, started to hang out and what internet offered me is a chance to choose my friends because you have this like people who go to school they have this weird idea that you know school is a great place for socialize what's better than you know to to to, to pick a lifelong friend from 30 people that you're locked in the same room <laughs> for 12 years you know without having a chance to you know to actually pick someone you like <laughs> Uh, to me, it always felt absurd because, like, why choose from 30 people that you're involuntarily uh, crammed into a room with uh, when you can pick from billions of people online? And that's where I found my friends and some of the friends uh, I'm still friends with uh, for, what, for 20 years now. How was a normal day? Like, you wake up at 8, yeah. you have to, that's like, that's yeah, yeah. very interesting. <laughs> yeah, Th that's, again, this is something, uh, this is... Uh, uh, I mentioned that my parents were not very experienced. So I my, believe my you were never late to school. I was never <laughs> late to school, but I was sleeping in. I didn't have, like, this is still a problem, like, if talking about problem. The problem for me was that I was not living by the schedule, really. Mm. Uh, I was avid reader 
so it was very easy f to convince me to read a book, to, 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 to read the textbook, to, to, to do something. I love I loved that. I loved studying. But I never had a proper schedule. And uh, we just mentioned internet. Uh, I was st like I was 12. I was staying up until 4 in the morning <laughs> and my parents couldn't do anything about it. And I was explaining it away saying, "Hey, you know, my friends like from Ohio that I met on net meeting, you know, they, it's a broad daylight there. Yeah. And, yeah, I got to talk with them and you know, I'm learning English. I'm and I did learn English by the way. <laughs> very well. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so th there were issues. I I'm not proud of how I spent most of my time. I think it could have been uh, organized much better. But again, I can't uh, I can't blame my parents for it because they just uh, they did an experiment that uh, was uh, very new uh, mm. that uh, they had no idea how to do right. I like today uh, coming from having this experience, you know, living my life, I know so many things that could have been done better. I could have spoke not just like the languages I do speak now. I mm. speak several languages like French, uh, some Japanese as well, uh, but I could have spoke fluently like five or six languages just by using the same amount of time that I had. But, um, well, I, I'm going to apply that knowledge to, to my own children. Well, <laughs> I am in favor of you, like how many kids from, from a normal school, like a proper school, uh, speak many languages or as many languages as you, like, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Still absolutely. Still absolutely. <laughs> and again, we're not talking, we're, we're talking about a boy who grew up in a poor family. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, my family, family became rich, but only when I, uh, uh, only, uh, on the way of raising you. Yeah, like, only when like I became, like in my late Mm. teens actually felt that I was better off than my neighbors, not before that. Uh, so, uh, uh, and they gave me that knowledge uh, through sheer uh, will of to experiment and I'm grateful for What that. do you think was the main advantage uh, that you reckon looking back uh, of being homeschooled? I'm not used to obeying. I'm not used to obeying. Uh, <laughs> and uh, because uh, the main thing that uh, government schools teach is not, uh, they don't give you knowledge. They uh, teach subjugation. Uh, and uh, uh, helplessness. They, they teach you to be helpless. Mm -hmm. So whenever a, a, a person of authority tells you something, you obey, because in school there's no other way to exist, right? I never had that experience. So for me, when I enrolled into university, for example, I had so many conflicts with uh, my teachers. Not because I was like uh, lagging behind uh, in doing something, no, because uh, in Russia, universities suck. Uh, they're very politicized mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a lot of teachers, they use the very small power over the students, you know, to, to grandstand, you know, to, to humiliate. I, I never, I never tolerated that. Uh, <laughs> I, even, I had a conflict in, 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 in on my first uh, course of university where we had this, uh, again, it's, uh, we had this teacher who was very old. He was very old school uh, and uh, they only kept him because they need to have a certain number of uh, PhDs. To, to qualify for some grants. And this is what's obvious. His, his lessons were terrible. <laughs> and he was humiliating students every time someone came in late. Like mm -hmm. Literally humiliating. It's like, it's terrible to, to hear. Mm. And uh, at one point, uh, uh, another, d another student started arguing with him and he just canceled the lecture and uh, um, made, uh, uh, made uh, how do you call it in English, um, the head of the department to, to, mm. to, to gather us, you know, to, to say we're sorry. And I watched every single student before me saying he was sorry for something he hasn't done, saying sorry uh, for a situation that he didn't create. And I was, I was terrified just looking at it. And I was the only one who said, what the, what the <laughs> hell? You know, I'm not sorry for anything. He should be sorry because, because of him we couldn't have a lesson. We're wasting our time here. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, what, 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 is, what, what is this circus? Uh, and yeah. I, and I, I'm pretty sure that was because I never went to school. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's really interesting what you mentioned. This is like such a, a root characteristic of the uh, educational system right now. Um, well, you study in the, um, in the Russian State University of Humanities. Yeah, where you that's where the story happened. Yes, uh, I, I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> so you study political science there yeah. or because you were there for two years and then you moved to Nottingham uh, University. University of Nottingham in the UK. Yes, uh, I studied the same uh, subject uh, in Russia and the UK. Why, so why did you move and what do you notice well, different? I moved, I moved mm. because Russian universities, especially uh, when talking about political sciences, are crap. They, they are awful. Uh, mm. And uh, I, if you want, like, yeah, if you want to, to learn politics, uh, to learn philosophy, you don't want to study in Russia if you, if you can afford not to. Uh, and uh, Britain, uh, on the contrary, 
Uh, I have a lot of issues with the educational system in the UK as well, but relatively speaking, it's one of the better ones. Mm. Uh, and I thought, unlike school education, university education is uh, something that can be useful. I starting to doubt that mm. as well. Uh, but uh, but uh, I, I learned something. Like I didn't learn anything in the Russian State University of Humanes. <laughs> I learned something in the UK. <laughs> uh, so. Well, you learn how, or, or you get to witness how the educational system works internally. So <laughs> that's yeah. something to learn, I believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Not what you were expecting, but... <laughs> and again, it's a good thing. Uh, mm. You need to have, and uh, I'm grateful for my parents, like I mentioned uh, to my parents that uh, I went for a year to this boarding school in Canada because it gave me, um, it gave me an opportunity to look into this educational system as well and see what's wrong with it. And I have lots of stories about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I want to get into yeah. that too. But yeah. uh, what th th there's a memory that you recall that impacted you as much as the one that you just mentioned in the Nottingham uh, University? university uh, it Nottingham. wasn't as bad. Uh, I think uh, it was not a bad university. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if you study humanitarian science, like um, uh, how do you call it in English? If you study humanes, uh, you don't really need to go to university, but you need to have a lot of personal discipline, which I didn't have. I mentioned it. Mm. So I think it was helpful in that sense. But uh, if uh, you are self-motivated, if uh, you can schedule your own time, there's nothing a university, even a good university, can give you if you study, if you study humanes. It's different if you study physics, it's different mm -hmm. if you want to be a doctor, it's different if uh, you, know, you require a laboratory yeah. or yes, right. equipment. You yeah, you, you got to go into university, mm. no doubt about that. But um, if you want to um, learn social sci sciences, you can do it at home today much more efficiently. You can watch a lecture from Harvard from the best, uh, yes. from the best lecturers. <laughs> the best lecturers. Uh, is everything in YouTube and in yes. <laughs> on internet. And then you can watch a lecture from Oxford, and then you can watch a lecture from MIT, and then you can watch a lecture from University of Nottingham. Everything is online. So why would you go into debt, and people go into debt to go to enroll into university? And, and you have to the to time study. to go to, s to the books that they probably won't give you sometimes. Like it happened, let's say, here in Chile, Let's say economics. Like, I don't believe many economists today in Chile just graduate mm -hmm. knows anything about uh, Austrian school of economics. Yeah, well, again, because yeah. uh, <laughs> because <laughs> the universities are so based um, mm. biased. Sorry, uh, nowadays. Yeah, uh, well, but um, again, uh, coming to like textbooks, like what struck me in Nottingham and coming from Russia it was not a problem for me, and I'm going to explain <laughs> why. But uh, you know, textbooks they cost what, thousands, oh, well, hundreds of dollars or British pounds, very expensive. And in Russia, I never experienced that. But in Russia, I was used to pirating. And um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and again, uh, it's education that you want to receive. And uh, if you are self-motivated, if you have no problem with discipline, you can study social scientists from, the, uh, from, the, from your own home uh, and do that. It's, uh, it's just a better way and you're going to save money, you're going to save time, you're going to get more dif different experiences, like whatever money you would spend on a university, you can spend traveling, you know, mm. seeing the world, experiencing things that you will never experience in the university because today universities, they don't give you that much experience. And again, uh, yeah, go on. No, no, I'm, I'm really interested in those memories, in, the, in, the, in those memories that you can recall or particular memories that impact you back in Russia because I actually got into libertarian ideas because I went to med school in Argentina mm -hmm. where more than medicine, I learned a lot about uh, Allende and, <laughs> and Che Guevara and yeah. all this. I learned about <laughs> Puebla, uh, <laughs> all these kind of things. I learned a lot about that, but not much about medicine. And that's what got, it, got me into libertarian ideas because it didn't make sense to me and I started to look for answers. But it makes, uh, but it makes sense to the government because the it government does. doesn't want you to be a professional. Gov government does not want you to be self-reliant or uh, successful. Government wants you to obey and in order to make you obey it uh, uh, instills those ideas into your brain while you're young and dependent uh, on the university for, uh, for your life. Basically. It is, I completely agree. I believe uh, the educational system is one of the main issues in Occident, at least. Um, so, 
just one more memory that you could recall from a Russian university that impact you positively or negatively? <laughs> no, well, Russian university was just a waste of time. Uh, there's nothing good I can recall. Uh, there's nothing positive apart from that I moved to UK and it was better there. Uh, so one out of 10 would not recommend. Really, there's no story. Like, the, the, okay, yeah, okay, there is another story. Yeah, all right, a, a Me Too story. <laughs> a Me Too story. Uh, okay, Russia is a fairly homophobic society, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of uh, closed homosexuals in Russia. And uh, apparently, uh, but they are still, they, they wield some power. Like, it's not like in Iran, where you can't be a homosexual and be in power. In mm -hmm. Russia, you can be a homosexual. And, uh, and be in power and uh, some universities had uh, the situation and basically uh, on the I, I wrote an article on the rise of me too uh, that I had a me too story as well that when I was studying in Russian Uni University of Humanes um, a, a dean of the uh, school that I was studying at was trying to hit on me and basically what he did uh, I, I got in trouble I went to the dean's office and he locked the room uh, and he started to, to attempt to kiss me, and I told him to fuck off. <laughs> uh, oh and God. again, and again, just uh, thinking back about it uh, is uh, the reason I knew how to say no is probably because I never went to school because <laughs> I did not feel this person had authority over me. I didn't respect it. Like uh, he didn't earn my respect. Mm -hmm. So I told him to fuck off. Uh, and uh, from what I've heard, it was an issue uh, for many, many years from before I became a student there till after I left. And uh, I've heard some um, bad stories. You probably weren't the first, absolutely. Right? I weren't the first, definitely. And not and the, the way, the way, <laughs> the way he approached me, the way he was acting, uh, it felt very sleazy. Uh, and again, if there was someone else there, it would have, might have turned quite differently. That's terrible, that's yeah. terrible. And it's a great point that you mentioned. So learn to say no. This is like, this is a very libertarian thing. It learn is. Learn to say no, it, can, it will save you a lot of uh, From trouble. a kiss of the dean. <laughs> well, <laughs> as well, <laughs> as well, <laughs> no, as well. <laughs> many other things, right? Yeah. How long have you been in Chile? I've been in Chile for two weeks, just, uh, just arrived recently. I've been traveling around, around uh, Latin America for over a year and a half since I uh, was forced to leave Russia. And I'm just uh, looking at the way people live. Tell us a little bit more about that. Why did you have to leave Russia? Uh, well, I had to leave Russia because it became impossible to do politics. And a lot of my friends uh, got arrested, uh, were forced in, into exile. And basically, um, my entire team, like the people uh, with whom I was organizing the rallies, I was organizing the lectures, they are all in, in exile right now. So some of them in Tbilisi, Georgia, some of them in Turkey, some of them in uh, Baltic states. And, uh, and they just had to leave uh, on a very short notice because people started to get arrested. And uh, you, you could feel that it's getting closer. And what uh, forced me to leave is uh, a good friend of mine, Andrei Pivovarov. He's not a libertarian, but he's uh, one of the opposition leaders in Russia as well. He got uh, taken off the plane on his way out of Russia. This is the first time it happened. And uh, b before that, uh, mostly the kind of people who got arrested were quite uh, a lot, uh, quite more influential than I am. And Andrei Pivovarov, he, he's very close to, to, like, to the same level of influence that I have. Mm -hmm. Maybe I was even more influential at a certain time. Uh, and that's when I realized that unless I'm gonna leave soon, I may not get a second chance. And uh, I, I was proved right because uh, uh, then the war started and now I'm, I'm 100% sure that if I was to return, I would be put in jail indefinitely. And Andrei Pivovarov, he's still in jail. And you also had some experiences in jail for some, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I three times, right? Uh, several, no, I think it was more than that. I think it was four or five in total, uh, but not for a long haul. So I only spent, in, in total, I spent like three or four months in jail. Why did you get prison? Why did you get prison for? Because government is unhappy with you. Uh, like the, 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 the biggest story, um, uh, my longest sentence uh, was after I disagreed to cancel a political rally that I was organizing, the government really wanted me to relocate on a different date. Uh, and that's how government sort of tests uh, your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So I was, I, I was invited into the uh, mayor's office, not to talk with the mayor, but with one of his uh, representatives, uh, where he was convincing me that you know the rally that I wanted to hold uh, was impossible to hold at that time, at that place, and they were offering shitty places. And they used this technique many, many times before, and I criticized every single politician 
who bend it to the government's will. Uh, so I said, well, it's impossible because you know people are counting on me. They are. Uh, this is where the rally is going to take place, and there's nothing I can do. Uh, so uh, on my way out of the of the the building, I was uh, apprehended by uh, police, uh, it's by special forces, uh, and I was talked to uh, by some of these like the I'm not going to call it secret agents. I'm not sure how it's called in English, but uh, by uh, uh, by the uh, arm of police that, mm -hmm. like... Uh, I understand what yeah, you mean. Yeah, that pressures you, basically. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was pressured, uh, interviewed, and then locked uh, uh, in the cell and then put in a jail for, for what, uh, for over a month. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. But again, a month in jail uh, is, not, is not that bad. It's, uh, uh, I always use this as an opportunity to read a, lots of books because lots there's books. nothing else to do. They just read. There is a great intellectual that I love. There is called Antonio Scocado, who also was put in jail, I think, two or three times. And yeah. the last time he was put in jail for over two years, he came out with a book named uh, The General Treat of Drugs, yeah. which is, was his bestseller and put him well off. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's it was like a you can, you can, like, <laughs> because you get cut off of your mon like mundane routine, uh, you can just uh, concentrate on reading and writing, and yeah. that's what I did. And uh, I'd say, you know, I never, I didn't have a, a negative experience of it. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I can switch myself uh, off uh, from from the surroundings and just yeah. concentrate on literature, and it helped me a lot. I know it's different for different people, and uh, I've met people who, who like uh, I, I had different ac activists uh, who were. Uh, in the same cell as I am, and I saw people, you know, shaking, you know, feeling claustrophobic, you know, fearing for their lives. Uh, I, I'm, I'm different in that sense. I always like I become calm. Mm. Like whenever I'm in a stressful situation, uh, I just have a wave of calm uh, going through my body, and uh, I don't feel a thing. So uh, for me, it was not difficult. Humble but, but pay vacation. Where? <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't call it a vacation. Again, I, would <coughs> <coughs> I wouldn't call it a vacation, but. Uh, um, and I'm just, just, just to stress, it's mm. very different mm. from going to jail for years. Yes. Again, a month, a month's time, nothing. If you're locked for a year, two years, three years, it builds up. So uh, people who are still in jail, like Andrei Pivovarov, I just mentioned, he has it immensely worse than I had. Yes. Immensely worse. No, what what Antonio Scutal, Antonio Scutal called him, called his the time in jail uh, as a paid humble but paid vacation so <laughs> yeah, again, uh, it depends uh, on like uh, government has means of turning your life into hell in absolutely jail. so you got to take that into account for absolutely. example <coughs> for example alexei navalny who's probably the the most famous russian opposition leader mm -hmm. uh, who's in jail right now uh after uh, after assassination attempt on him he survived and he was locked uh, for surviving basically uh, so uh, uh, right, right now he's being tortured in jail not by means of you know uh, putting uh, putting needles under mm. your nails but in terms of he's not allowed to read he's not allowed to socialize he's not allowed to see his lawyer he's constantly closed into the uh, isolation chamber so things like that and uh, um, when things like that happen you can't you can't uh, read anymore you can't do anything uh, so uh, yeah, uh, don't if you can avoid going to jail, do avoid going to jail, but uh, uh, try to prepare yourself for it. Anyway. I believe for people it's hard to picture what it is to be a, a you know a political opposition in a totalitarian country. Mm -hmm. You just were mentioning before we start the interview that one of your friends also have a, a assassination attempt just recently. Uh, we w yeah yeah you just today um, um, he's a. Uh, He's a collaborator on my YouTube channel. He's been on several of my shows. Uh, uh, of, um, Asechkin, his last name is Asechkin. Uh, and uh, he basically, he's a whistleblower and he published a lot of damning uh, footages of torture within the Russian prison system. And c you can Google his name, he's uh, very prominent. And just today he announced that uh, he, there was an assassination attempt on him, even though he lives in France, he lives in Paris. Um, there were some agents uh, sent to him to that uh, tried to, to murder him. Terrible, terrible. And Bellingcat is working on that case right now, so they confirmed that the assassination attempt happened. So yeah, uh, doing politics in Russia is dangerous business. 
it's, it's incredible what you're telling us. As I said, like people, it's hard for them to picture how it is actually, and all these uh, anecdotes, these stories, to let them like picture in a better way what is it, it is. The thing, the thing is with the human uh, psychology is that uh, whenever you survive something, it becomes a funny story. It becomes an anecdote. You cease to realize, you know, that's a fucked up situation. Yes. Uh, and I had a lot of fucked up situations in my life as well, but uh, <coughs> now that uh, because I managed to survive, because uh, nothing bad, thank God, happened to me, uh, right now it's just you know a, a car conversation piece. Yes, yes, yeah. I completely agree. <laughs> I completely agree. It's analyzed. Uh -huh. um, why? Why do you pick Chile now? Why? What? what? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I came to see the referendum. Yes. Uh, so I timed it to see the voting, to see the results, and it was uh, very uplifting to see that it failed. <laughs> uh, well done, guys. Uh, yes. Do repeat again. Um, I wanted to see the sentiment on the streets, and it was uh, amazing to see the, con the, the referendum failing and, you know, people, you know, cheering, you know, coming out with the national flags. Uh, it, it felt like a national unity. So, uh, well done. And the a piece of advice from someone coming from a country where there are no political institutions, don't uproot, don't uproot the institutions that you have, uh, improve upon them, build upon them, because it's much easier to destroy than it is to build something new, uh, and your constitution is functional, you have the most functioning society in Latin America, and you should do everything you can to try to preserve it, because look, look at your neighbors, look at Argentina, look at... Uh, uh, Bolivia, look at Peru, look how much worse they have it than you do, uh, and uh, be more careful with uh, the kind of reforms that uh, um, that you try to partake in. Again, I'm not saying that your system should not be reformed, I'm not saying it cannot be improved upon, I'm saying that because it's already so much better than a lot of alternatives, you should be careful with it, you should not uh, um, throw sto stones in a glass house, so to speak. Absolutely agree. D did it match your expectations? Uh, yeah, Chile di definitely did. Uh, it's uh, it's my second time in Chile. I was in Chile eight years ago as a tourist, and I think uh, it's uh, like the city center looks worse than it used to. Uh, it looks more seedy. It looks more trashed, and uh, I don't. I will never get that thing. You know, like trashing the uh, the district uh, where you live in. It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Las Condes, where I'm staying, is so much nicer because people are not trashing it. You mm -hmm. know, get like, uh, and again, <laughs> the reason why left does it is to perpetuate uh, is to perpetuate uh, the poverty, is to perpetuate uh, um, the social distress. Because whenever people are poor, whenever they are angry, <coughs> whenever people are poor, whenever they are angry, whenever they uh, uh, have to depend on the government to whenever there is chaos, whenever there is chaos, yes, they are uh, so much more vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, and they are so much more willing to 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 surrender their freedoms, uh, and that's what the left bets on. Uh, and uh, in that sense, the uh, goals of libertarians are much more ambitious because mm -hmm. we don't want to create a vulnerable individual. We are not trying to subjugate someone. We're trying to elevate people to become self-reliant, to, 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 to be self-sufficient, to not uh, rely on the government for survival. And it's a much more ambitious task. Uh, the question I'm always asked is, you know, if, you're, if libertarians' ideas are so good, why is it so hard to spread it? Well, because, because these ideas are good, because they are ambitious, it's much easier to ruin something, it's much mm -hmm. easier to subjugate someone than to elevate uh, the person. It's much easier to corrupt than to create. So uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's hard to be a libertarian, but it's a noble thing to be. I absolutely agree, um, Mikhail. So you left, uh, firstly, right uh, from Russia, and why do you pick South America? Uh, several reasons. I lived in Europe uh, for many years. I spent four years in UK, and I spent f almost four years in France, and I traveled all around the European Union. I just don't like it. It's uh, there's not that many freedoms. There's a lot of order. Uh, but uh, you're not free in Europe, you, but not, not just because the taxes are high, uh, but uh, unless you're like, immensely rich, and I'm talking about like tens of millions of euro, uh, you will never break the ceiling, you will never break out uh, into a better social standing than you are in now. Uh, I think uh, um, 
vertical mobility in European yes. countries is terrible. It's, it's absolutely terrible. Yes, you can be comfortable. Yes, you are guaranteed like a, a good meal. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you are gu guaranteed uh, that you're not going to live on the street uh, if you work, but. Uh, you will never break out of your uh, social standing. That's a great point because Chile used to be the the leader country from the OCDE uh, uh, with the uh, social mobility. Yeah. We have the most, uh, the biggest social mobility in, in all the developing countries. Yeah. Um, well, not anymore. <laughs> well. <laughs> really. But it's a, it's a really important thing because it's part of, uh, you know, what are your, your goals as, a, as an individual? What do you want to do with your life? Do you want just to stay every day, living every day like... You yeah, know, if, you, if you want to exist, day? then Europe is probably a great place to be uh, because it's like the, this, uh, this uh, retirement house. It's a great retirement house, you know, with great buildings, great architecture, mm. beautiful, beautiful parks. Uh, but uh, if you have ambitions in your life, you're not going to realize yourself in Europe. And look uh, how few names, uh, you know, how... Uh, come out of Europe, like you, you can't name a single, um, like Elon Musk is mm -hmm. impossible in Europe. Uh, Bill Gates is impossible in Europe. Well, I, I that's don't like why Bill they're not there. That's <laughs> why they're not there. <laughs> if you have uh, any ambition at all in mm. your life, you don't want to be in Europe. Uh, US is a different story. US is much more interesting. It's much more diverse. And uh, uh, this is a country where I can imagine myself to be, but uh, I'm afraid of American globalism. I think like uh, American citizenship is uh, basically scary. I know a lot of people want to become American citizens. Uh, I, I don't because it's the only country with uh, global jurisdiction. Mm. So uh, they subjugate you to their own laws. It doesn't matter where you are. So you can be, you can uh, act totally legally in one country, but you will be breaking law at the same time in the US uh, just by uh, virtue of being an American citizen. To mm. me, this is scary. To me, the American tax, tax system is scary. Uh, the global taxation system that doesn't matter where you work, you yes. know, you pay to the American government. I, I don't want to do that. Um, it, it has its up upsides. So uh, America is a functional s functioning society. Latin America is different. Is uh, It has a lot of potential. It has a lot of chaos, but it's a different kind of chaos mm. than exists in Russia. Uh, in From this chaos, you can, if you're ambitious, if you have... Uh, uh, a, a strong vision of what you want to do in life, you can realize yourself here. So I, I, I love Latin America. It's, uh, it has all the good uh, upsides of Russia and uh, <laughs> none of the downsides. <laughs> uh, so you don't have a tyrannical, like you have some tyrannies like in Venezuela, obviously. In, uh, I, I'm very unhappy with Argentina. <laughs> uh, and I know, I know Chileans, for some reason, have a spot, soft spot for Argentina. <laughs> I don't get it. Argentina <laughs> is like going back to USSR today. Like nothing works, <laughs> nobody works. Uh, the city is a mess. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like Buenos Aires at all. But anyway, uh, in some of the <coughs> in some of the Latin American countries, uh, there's a lot of opportunity if you're a young, ambitious, uh, and you want to do something out of yourself. So I, I really, really like it here. Well, Mikhail, we have uh, we hope to have you for longer. And of course, uh, if you want to come around again, just give us a call. We always have happy to hang out and talk about these philosophical questions and Absolutely. about our societies. Uh, it's been great to have you here. I don't know if you have any last uh, words that you would like to share. Um, last words. Uh, yeah, I think uh, going back to your constitution is that uh, try to preserve what good you have in Chilean society because you have uh, a lot of functioning institutions that, yes, some of them require reforms. They can be improved upon, uh, but don't, don't try to uproot them. Uh, look at Russia. You know, we tried it several times. We uprooted it in 1917. Nothing good came out of it. Nothing good comes out of a revolution uh, in a sense of, you know, don't try to build a new society on the ashes of the old society. Try to build upon the old society. This is how you improve. And uh, this is not just the lesson of Russia. This is the lesson of uh, Great Britain, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, look at Great Britain. Yes, some of their institutions don't make sense. You know, I, 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 I can't really defend monarchy, <laughs> uh, but I will defend monarchy as it exists today in, in Great Britain because uprooting it means a revolution. And revolution means losing all this uh, great knowledge, all this great experience that you as a society had. Again, look at China. China had a revolution. Uh, it lost its culture. It lost it, uh, its institutions like mm, um, 
even on the level like the Shaolin monastery mm -hmm. right now it's a Disneyland there's nothing there's no like history behind it anymore there's no people who remember what it means to to work in the monastery like uh, this. we don't even need to go too far we have Venezuela just next yeah, just, yeah, you well. know just <laughs> crossing the fence <laughs> so we yeah. have Argentina we have Bolivia we have Peru we have Ecuador we have all these cases right all these examples historical examples of what is being uh, like the, the essence of uh, uh, South America uh, history which every time things start to do a, go a little bit right or go a little bit wrong we try to change everything yeah, again. This is always a mistake and uh, I understand why it happens and I think the libertarians have similar worldview sometimes they think that uh, you know uh, we need to get rid of the government it's uh, anarcho-capitalist and we need <laughs> to have a libertarian revolution and we do need to have a libertarian revolution but uh, uh, we need to have it as a concept, so uh, as a concept of this um, perfect society, you know, like idea like the pl platonic ethos. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be perfect, you know. It has to be different from what we have today. But uh, you are judged by the fruits of your labor. Uh, it doesn't matter how good your idea is. If the result of your political wor work is shit, for example, like co like communism, mm -hmm. okay, it, it might be a great. I, I disagree, but it, even if it was a great idea in principle, uh, if it always leads to a disaster. It means you're doing something wrong, uh, and uh, we uh, libertarians should uh, learn from from our enemies' mistakes and uh, try to preserve and uh, pick uh, uh, good things that we have, and just slowly moving the society towards freedom. And if it's possible, to erode this the, the government, to erode its power over people, uh, not uproot it. Because if we're gonna uproot it, uh, you're not gonna end up in a libertarian utopia. You're gonna end up in hell. Not a libertarian hell quite a statist hell. Um, so keep that in mind. Thank you very much, Michael, and taking his last words. We do need to uh, understand that we cannot build from ashes, right? We yeah. need to start shooting. I mean, you can if you have no other choice. Oh, no like other if, choice. If, if, if the tragedy has already happened, uh, of course, you, you got to make with the, what you have. Uh, but uh, don't, don't uh, strive for that scenario. And it's very important also to have you here. We need more libertarian lives. We need to be get closer together. We, for some reason, we tend to just you know disperse and just, just don't talk with each other and have these uh, silly uh, discussions about theory instead of actually putting the right effort into promoting or our ideas mm -hmm. and showing to this uh, uh, to the society our proposals. What are our proposals? People yeah. don't even know what this flag means. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what libertarianism is. Like as soon as they see this flag here in the streets in Chile, they call you a fascist. It's mm -hmm. like, man, <laughs> no, the opposite. Like we're absolutely the opposite to fascism. So, uh, well, great to have you here, Mikhail. And we hope you enjoyed this interview. This is just the first part. Just follow up uh, with the second video so you can see uh, more about this incredible chat that we had with Mikhail Svetov, uh, one of the main leaders of the libertarian movement in Russia. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks. It's Thank been a pleasure. Much, Thank you. <laughs>